and I would like to formally welcome everyone to today's Allure Manufacturing Demo. I am Linda Kiernan, the Sales and Customer Account Manager for Tandem Technologies. Uh, Tandem has six locations in the states with experts in accounting and the manufacturing arenas. And today we've invited Rod Hatcher, the founder of TIW Corporation, uh, to present the Allure Manufacturing Solution. Um, Rod has over 30 years in the manufacturing industry. And TIW, or Technology Industrial Workplace, was founded in 1983 by Rod uh, while he was working as the manager of marketing research and planning at Ingersoll Rand Rock Drill Division. Um, TIW believes in a solution that is modifiable and supplies a wide variety of customizing tools companies' needs for reports, language, and screens. Um, the TIW Corporation is a member of the National Federation of Independent Business, and they're also very much involved Hello. in the Association for Operations Management. So with that being said, um, I will uh, pass the baton over to you, Rod. And again, thank you for presenting this today for us. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Linda. Um, what I'll do is I'll start by answering the very first question everybody has, which always is, what is a Lear? And um, that name actually comes from our chart of accounts. And if you look at a chart of accounts here on the screen, you'll see that it says assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses, which spells a Lear, A-L-E-R-E. -E. We're not a very inventive group, but we're good at stealing ideas. And that seemed like a real good name for the product, and that's how it's got its name. Uh, by coincidence, a leer stands in Latin means to grow. So that's why we have a, a leaf for our logo. What we have, what we're showing today is our new product 11. And it, we have moved to a ribbon type menu, which you can see across the top here. And this is our full range of offerings. And we're going to focus today on the uh, as requested on the manufacturing side. And uh, manufacturing, we view it as three key areas, a uh, production area where you're actually going to do your day-to-day -day activities as, uh, as starting work orders and processing work orders and uh, collecting data and making postings are all done in the production area. In the uh, Secondary engineering, traditionally that's where the engineering manufacturing side is where routes are developed and bills of material are developed. And in the third area, logistics, is where the planning functions of manufacturing takes place. And we'll touch on each of these as we go along. A um, little background, uh, Lear manufacturing is what we would call a discrete manufacturing system, uh, meaning that it's expecting you to be doing jobs in discrete batches uh, rather than continuous process where you turn it on and turn it off a month later and see how much you made. So as a discrete manufacturer, we're looking for jobs that have routes and often uh, bills of material that go with them. We're also what's called a uh, uh, a big handful called uh, forward backward finite scheduling, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit too. What, what we have tried to do, do, and we'll start right up front with the production side under what we call a, a standard work order. And most companies, manufacturing facilities will work with a work order. Some will call it a traveler, uh, lots of different names, but fundamentally a work order is that job ticket that you put out in the shop that says here's what i want to build and here's how many i want to build here's the list of materials to go with it and here's the route i want you to use uh, so what we've done is incorporated all that into one document so you have a header which gives you that information of what you're going to start with and how many you're projected to finish with uh, yeah, an item number uh, the route that you want to use 
If there's customer information, that's filled in uh, automatically when you create a work order from a sales order. Okay. And of course, when you want to start it and what it's needed by, uh, what's scheduled to be done, and perhaps what it's been shipped and completed. Okay. And you give it a priority and you give it how you want it to schedule it. So that's on that first tab. The second tab on a work order is a description of how you're going to build something. In this case, it has uh, seven steps, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. Each step is an operation. And as I click on each step, you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen the details of that particular step. And that may be the operation number, what work center is going to be used, how many you're going to make at a time. Uh, Overlap is a, an advanced scheduling option that we give you uh, for manufacturers that make, say, 60 of something, and they have multiple steps. What you may want to do is not wait for all 60, 60 to be completed on the first step. You basically want to say, as soon as I get enough done to feed the next step, start that. So in, in, in an overlap situation, we may get 10 of the 60 done. Those 10 get moved to the second step. The second step can start. Uh, so it gives you a way of moving items as they are completed from step to step, which greatly uh, compresses the time that it takes for a work order to be run through a shop. Works in some manufacturing uh, situations, and in others it doesn't. But it's a, uh, an option that we give you. Uh, each one get, gives you a description. The screens are all stretchable so that you can open them up in any way you deem necessary to provide information. Um, each, every single step can have a setup time, what kind of labor grade you need uh, to perform that operation, what their use is going to be. So what's basically saying here is, to set up to prepare to do this step, Operation 40, it's going to take you, it should take about 15 minutes. You need somebody that is qualified to an AS1 label, uh, level grade, and it's going to consume 100% of their time. Um, for the cycle side, it's going to take 30 minutes per item uh, to get through that operation. And again, requires an AS1 grade, and that's also going to be 100%. Now, the reason we assign the percentages is for the cases where you may have automated machinery in a cell or circular type arrangement, and you have one operator that's managing multiple different machines. So you can divide up their time uh, by indicating what percent of their time will be devoted to any particular step on any particular machine. OK. And it will also give you things like your start quantity, your yield, your change, your finish quantity, uh, you know, I, ways of managing cases where you may start with one. It may be a 10 foot steel bar. You want to saw it in 10 parts. So you may start with one, but end up with a yield of 10. Uh, so this gives you a way of increasing or decreasing how much you expect to start that step with and how much you expect to end up with. Um, other items, I'll, let me jump back to the first step here. And, uh, and I, it, when I get through this, I'll, I'll take you through all the components that support what's going on in this work order. We have, in any field, we have what's called a hyperlink. And what that hyperlink allows you to do, by right-clicking, you can insert a hyperlink. And that allows you to tie your document to perhaps instructions for doing a setup, uh, a website that may provide you further information on, on uh, managing that piece of equipment. It may, in this case, uh, we inserted a picture that shows what it is you're going to be doing on that very first step. That could be embedded right into the route. But anything you would like can be embedded in any of these open fields, OK? Um, one of the primary reasons for doing that is that it provides document management throughout the system. 
but we have found in today's manufacturing facilities, skilled labor is a real challenge for many people. And the only way to properly pass on skilled labor, uh, skill sets is to embed that skill information right down at the route level. So a hyperlink could be going out to a video that is someone demonstrating how to run a piece of equipment or how that particular handlebar tubing is bent or painted or powder coated. So it provides, the hyperlink provides a way of passing knowledge to the person that's doing the job and documenting how that job should be done. So a very important aspect of almost any type of manufacturing. It could be simple to, you know, you tape up a box in this order, uh, or it could be complex, uh, which might demonstrate how you take a tool to measure hardness on a piece of uh, metal that had just been fired, okay? But that's an important element of uh, manufacturing is the ability to embed these hyperlinks to pass that knowledge and pass that support along in the process of doing the job. A little further, we've often seen that with the advent of smartphones and digital cameras, we've seen a lot of manufacturers that take pictures of the job to document what was done. For example, if you're in the aircraft industry, there's a lot of traceability required and you need a lot of proof of what was done before that item can be certified. So taking a digital picture and embedding that picture into that work order document that will show that yes, indeed, 12 rivets were placed into that bar before the cover was put on. And here's the picture to document those rivets being in place. So it acts both as passing knowledge along and documenting a process it is, is why I spend time on hyperlinks because they're really so important to most manufacturers. Moving along, um, there's each step has multiple miscellaneous fields. And you'll see those at the bottom right here. Um, one of the common things we find is those miscellaneous fields can be independently labeled with prepositioned or selections of information or freeform information that can be entered. In this case here, it's saying, okay, on this particular step, build handlebars, it's asking for an inspection result. And that was a miscellaneous field, and we just simply named it inspection. And actually, I'll show you over in global codes, I can pop up a little screen, and I'll scroll down to route operation codes. And you'll see here that I took the field name, which used to be MISCO1, and I put in what I wanted it to say, inspection results. And then I gave it three, uh, three items that it could be, uninspected, pass, or fail. And that resulted, when I saved this, that resulted in it updating my system so that these two fields here, inspection results and inspector, which is the next code, inspector, show up on your route uh, step. So this can be done on any work order, on route steps or headers. You have these miscellaneous fields you can work with. In this case here, because I would say something like, somebody would double click and say, okay, we inspected this part, it failed. Or we can say, we inspected this part and it passed, we can move on to the next step. And then it leaves a spot for someone to enter their initials that they were the one that checked it. And this becomes a saved part of that work order. So you, you've documented that process, that QC process. Okay. Um, so Route tab gives you all those instructions and all your documentation and uh, your knowledge base to perform those operation steps. The third tab is material. In this case, I really don't have any material in the, in the system. So let's, let's move to one that does. Here's a worker that has a list of the material that's gonna be required to make that work order. Uh, they All the material is gonna be ever, issued on step 10, 
if I click on it, it, it uh, says in the upper right what that item, what that description item is. It tells me how many I need for that step, how many have been allocated, how many have been used, and how many have been unused. And it will track that as you move through the job and issue material to a job from inventory and use that material. It will deallocate that in, in uh, inventory and assign that uh, inventory, I'm sorry, those uh, components to that job along with their costs. So header is permission, route is instructions, material is a list of items you're going to need to make something. We add another step in here called configuration. And let's see if I can, I can find one that has, oh, there we go, it has one kind of configuration on it. Um, I'll show you in a moment bills of material, but this is where this comes from. And in this particular job, we are making a men's 21 speed white mountain bike. Uh, I use bicycles because many years ago I used to use airplanes, but nobody recognized anything I was talking about. So we had to switch to something that people were a little more familiar with. <laughs> um, what this is, is it says when we made that, when we're processing this work order, this is how the options that have been selected, how this particular product is to be built. It's to have one reflector on it. We're going to use regular brake assembly. It has a 21 speed bike on it. It's a men's frame, and that men's choice is going to be in white. It's not going to have a light on it. It's going to have a gel saddle on it because it's an all terrain bike to absorb those bumps, a particular important feature to uh, people that are of the male sex. And there is also uh, tires that are knobby and they're lot numbered. So those are the choices that made up how this order was to be configured and processed through the job. So that, that's the configure tab. There's an ID tab. Uh, and let me see if I have a order here that I can demonstrate what the ID tab is for. Apparently I do not, I'm sorry. Uh, the ID tab, what that does is, uh, oh, here we go. It tracks if you're making an item that has serial numbered items in it or lot numbered items as raw material, you're going to want to issue that from inventory and you're going to want to track what serialized items and what lot numbered material went into building that item. And that's what this does is it keeps track for you of those items as they are issued it will compile all the serial numbers and all the lot good items that went into that particular item. Now, does not matter to many manufacturers, but for manufacturers that require that traceability, it gives you that ability to see what's been issued, what's been assigned, and how the serial numbers have been uh, set up. The uh, Fifth tab, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Fifth tab is transactions. Um, let's see if I can find an order here that has, here have, has transactions on it. Okay. A Lear is what's called a, a transaction based system. And what that means is that as a job goes through the shop, you're going to tell it what operation step you're on. In this case, this code is OS for operation start, when it was started, how long it took. And then there'll be things like MAs issue all material, MI are, are individual material issues from inventory. Uh, there's overhead, there's labor applied. Uh, so as people post their time to a job, that gets accrued to the job. And this gives you a running look at what all the transactions that occurred, everything that, that touched that work order, the material that was given to it, the people that worked on it, the time it took, their cost, the material cost. Um, if there are overheads, fixed or variable, they're automatically applied to the job. So at the end of a job, you get a nice record of everything that got touched. Now I'll mention at this point, there are multiple different ways of entering transactions. Uh, many people, you'll see on the bottom of the screen here, I'll click to one that's highlighted, perhaps, okay. It says scan F4. Um, 
the ALIR system has a uh, completely integrated uh, data acquisition so that with barcode, uh, you can enter all of your transactions. And in fact, the work orders themselves can be printed with those barcodes on them uh, to make it very easy for you to barcode when you start a job, well, issuing the material, posting the labor, finishing the step, moving it to the next step. So uh, you can do it manually by entering, as it shows you on the bottom here, manual transactions and selecting what operation it's on, selecting from a list of different transactions uh, that may be used to track that job on the date and time. And that can be done manually or it can be done with uh, barcoding. Very straightforward way of doing it. The status tab is where it's telling you what the condition of that order is in right now. And I will pick one here. That Here's one here that's in process. And the status tab is you can create a work order. And before that work order gets sent to the shop, it goes through what's called an FPO process. And FPO stands for firm planned order. And that is saying that this job was authorized to be released to the, to the shop by Bob. And it was this particular one happened to be FPO'd on December 1st, 2012, and what time it was uh, it was uh, released. Um, FPO is not something we made up. We we follow very closely for those that are in the manufacturing area. We follow the APEX standards, American Production Inventory Control Standards. So if, if you're familiar with APEX and you have one of their dictionary that defines standards and the terms. Uh, every term that we have in the system, you can look up in their dictionary and we follow what that definition is, that term is. So um, we believe that uh, one of the drawbacks to many systems is they tend to have terms that are made up on the fly and they're not standard terms. And we wanted to be able to use a knowledge base that people that are certified with APEX uh, training and backgrounds are very familiar with the product right out of the box. There's very little learning that they need to go through because they are already familiar with the terms and processes that are being used. Um, there's a notes area, and that's just kind of uh, to allow you to put in photographs and instructions or remarks or if something didn't finish the way it should. It allows you to document why it didn't finish the way it should, or perhaps it's waiting on a part to catch up with it, or perhaps a part was scratched and was sent out to be repainted or repowder coated and the job's waiting for that. So there's just a general notes area for that. So that's that's kind of a walkthrough of, of what a work order is as a uh, uh, as a document. And that's that's pretty much the backbone of the system. Now that's that's the long description. If you look at production up here, this what I just showed you is the standard work order. We found almost without exception, manufacturers like to do things as quick as possible. So we have what we call the express work order. And this is a case where you don't want to go through that paperwork path. You just simply want to say, uh, go get something out in the shop. It's going to take you 10 minutes or stay after an hour and make some extras of these or Somebody gives you four that you didn't know you had. What Express does is exactly that. It's a super fast way of processing an order through manufacturing and putting it in the inventory. And I'll give you an example. We'll build a uh, brake assembly here. And I'll make uh, one of them. And I'll say, OK, make one of these for me. Uh, Post it, it goes out, creates the order, FPOs it, posts the labor, issues the, issues the material, completes the order, you're done that quick, okay? What it leaves in, in behind it is it actually creates, and it tells you right here on the screen, it created for me order 1014. So if I go back to my standard work order, 1014. There's the order that that express order created. 
the header, the route, material, you know, if it was a configuration or transact, it posted, auto posted all the transactions for me. Um, so it created what the, it created that order, which I just spent 10 minutes explaining, literally in a couple of seconds, put it away into inventory for you, and you still have a valid record of what was done. So it's the shortcut way of producing things in manufacturing and keeping things simple. So that's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg for processing uh, items in manufacturing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that we provide you with, with uh, doing mass transactions and uh, doing external postings. You, you can post from manually or from a spreadsheet or for data acquisition. Uh, you can do inquiries. Um, you can say, okay, uh, how many of this item are we currently making? And it says, okay, right now we've got one job baking this item, and it's making 12 of them, and they're expected to be done on November 14th. And if I want to see what that job is, I can double click on it, and it brings up the work order that we're working on. So this inquiry is commonly used for a customer calls up and says, hey, what's the status of my job? Uh, and you can put in that customer's sales order or that customer number, and uh, it will show you every job you're working on for that customer and allow you to find out when it's to be done and uh, how far, what operation it step is on and how many are being made. So there's all kinds of those things that are built in the product. Um, what I showed you just there was what's called screen on screen. Um, we give you a product that allows you to open pretty much any process and display that process, uh, display that so that you can take your valuable real estate on your screen and work on multiple items at one time. So we don't force you into that situation of open one thing, finish your job, close it, put it away, open another thing. You can be working on multiple items all at one time. Um, I always like to joke that there is a slight drawback to doing this, and that is that frequently when people get used to using multiple screens, at the end of the day, they end up with 100 screens open, and now it's going to take them a half hour to clean up the desk. So we added a little shortcut in over here by going to File and clicking Close All Screens. It cleans up your desktop for you. So but it's a nice way of allowing clean workflow and allowing people to work just as you do on your desktop because the reality is on your desktop you have multiple pieces of paper laying all over your desktop and you're you're picking the one up you want to work on well that's essentially the way our software works you have multiple pieces of paper laying on your screen you pick up the one you want to work on and proceed but that's that's uh, what we do in that area now there's all kinds of reports there's a order reports, there's pick lists, there's work orders. I'll uh, uh, let's see, because I actually, actually have to pick a work order here to show it to you. Okay. Here's what work order looks like uh, to put out a piece of paper, and you can add your logo to it. And in this case here, I just pick, picked a, a small one. It just gives the key information from that work order. People usually bag this up into some kind of folder or plastic bag and pass it along. Uh, I could optionally print that with barcoding if you want to use barcoding. I think that is one of the options on the report. Show, show barcode, yes. There's the same order with barcoding on it. Uh, it it the, uh, uses a standard three and nine barcoding, which you are more than happy to uh, you're more than welcome to pick whatever type of barcoding suits you best for your operation. 309 seems to be the one that is most commonly used. While we're here, let's just talk about a standard item in terms of reports. Um, every report, you're probably used to being able to pick many, many options for a report. Well, we add a couple others. We can send it to the screen. We can print it. We can export the report to an Excel spreadsheet. We can turn it into a PDF and email it. So every one of our reports in the system give you multiple outputs. Um, 
that allow you to manage a report because oftentimes it's not just enough to print it. You want to make a copy of it and send it to somebody via an email. And that is something you can do throughout the product with our reports. There are lots of control reports to track your serial numbers, material IDs, what's open, what's unfinished, what your working process balances are, um, the activities, uh, how much you have in your shop for work in process by customer, productivity reports, sales work in process, transactions, reconciling work orders to make sure their balances come out correct. So there's many, many reports throughout the system to support you. There's a definition where you can set up how you want to apply overhead. And again, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the full Monty here. You can use the system to whatever depth you find is suitable to your operation and your requirements. Uh, many manufacturers, when they produce an item, they not only want to capture the cost of the material but they and the cost of the labor, but they want to assign overhead to it. Those overheads basically come in two forms, a fixed overhead and a variable overhead. And we provide multiple ways to apply each of those overheads with rates and percentages for each and which GL accounts they should hit in your general ledger. Because you're going to want to be able to see at the end of each month or whatever, how your fiscal period is set up, you want to be able to see what is the total value of the work in process I have going on. Uh, what is the total uh, variance amount that I've absorbed? If you're a standard good, if you follow standard goods costing, and that standard good item is a hundred bucks, and you finish it, and uh, it only costs ninety-two dollars, well, it still gets posted in the inventory at a hundred bucks, but you have a nine-dollar or an eight-dollar credit variance because you were more efficient. Uh, conversely, if it wasn't efficient and there were problems with the order. It's still going to be placed in to inventory at the standard cost, but now you've got to account for that variance, that overage that took you to make that item. So we track all of that inside the overhead here. Um, there are labor grades, and this is where you can set up people, uh, numbers of people, and indicate, uh, for instance, Roy Marsh here is qualified as an ASA 1 labor grade and his standard rate and what his employee number is. Well, Roy Marsh could be in here multiple times. He may be one labor grade as an assembler, one labor grade as a packer, one labor grade as a welder. And each of those um, particular labor grades could, could have a different hourly rate that he gets that gets charged against a job when he when you record his time. So that's the purpose of labor grades. Okay. There is, uh, over our, on the cost side, there's inquiry where you can do, this is a very common one that people will use if they're building products to stock. Um, they basically want to be able to say, look, I want to take an item here and I want to roll that item up and I want to find out what that item is going to cost based upon standard cost. And it says, all right, if I roll it up, um, my my standard cost currently is $500, but I'm calculating based upon the current way your route is set up and the current cost of your materials and inventory and the current way you have overhead applied, you're going to have a cost variance of $91.89. It's going to cost you that much more. And you're going to see that as a variance over your standard cost of $500. And it will show you a detail of how that was calculated. And it will show you material, labor, fixed overhead, variable overhead, the totals, your unit cost, and where the variance occurred when that job was rolled up. This is commonly used, even if you're not standard cost, this is commonly used to set a price in the inventory for an item. And based upon what your current cost is, what the retail price is you should be selling it for. So this is a very heavily used function that we have. And we actually have a function in the cost of roll-up um, that will allow you to actually generate and post 
new costed rollups. So I could put a range of items in here, do a costed rollup for all of them, examine what my current inventory cost is versus what my current rolled up cost is, and I decide on a case by case basis whether I need to change my inventory value and consequently my retail prices or my costs that I'm going to sell for. Um, and this will also, when it does this, it will change the cost of inventory and it will do the general ledger transactions because if you're if you have a standard cost that goes up, that affects the valuation of your inventory. Uh, most people were, are working with a bank, and your bank is going to want to know what your inventory value is. Uh, so this gives you the, an ability to keep that value as accurate as you can and uh, as timely as you can. So that's kind of an overview of that production area. Engineering area, uh, well, let's start with the master route because that's where we tend to differ from many products. Um, how many bills of material do you have? Well, if you require bills of material, you probably have a bill of material for every single item you make and every single permutation of that item. So you can end up with thousands and thousands of bills of material and it can take you a lot of time to maintain those bills of material. How about this bill of material here to build a bicycle? And this particular bill will allow you to build around 2,000 different bicycles with one single bill of material. Why would that be important to you? Well, obviously it's a lot less work to set up. But more importantly is the accuracy on a bill, because when you do material planning, if there is a mistake in a bill of material, you're making two mistakes. First, you ordered the wrong part. And secondly, you failed to order the right part. So having inaccurate bills can cost a lot of money. Um, having one single bill structure vastly increases your chances of having very accurate bills. And the way this works is a tree structure where I can drill down to the tree at two different levels and we'll support 25 levels down and you can see the components at each level. Importantly though are these little colored cubes here. What these are are what's called a modular bill and a modular bill is a question really. It's saying what brake assembly and then underneath it you list here are the two brake assemblies that will work on this bicycle. And if you recall back on the work order, there's a configuration tab. Let's see here. That's where those choices came from. So what you see on this bill of material is the different ways, the different permutations you could make something. Um, and when that work order is created, it's allowing you to make those choices that are then inserted onto this config tab to make that particular item. In this case here, we started with a bike assembly to be configured, and it ended up as a men's 21 speed white mountain bike when the choices were made. So a bill of a modular bill allows you to compress many, many choices down into one bill structure. Um, and it also gives you increases accuracy, decreases the time to maintain it. And this acts also at the sales order end. If you're using our accounting side, it will roll up so that you have a free sales order configurator when you enter an order if i could i can enter an order for this bike assembly mbba01 and it will pop up right on my sales order it'll bring up a set of questions and it'll ask you it'll guide you through those questions that you need to ask your customer to fill out and complete their order so it it has does double duty when you maintain your bill of material with modular type bills you get a free sales order configurator to support your sales or uh, sales entry desk. And there's a whole, we give a class where we spend hours explaining how this works and what the implications are 
and how you can set up finished good. You can configure different finished goods to pre-select what choices are made and how it tracks that in inventory accurately. But the key item to take away from this is fast bills of material, easy to handle bills of material, and exceptionally accurate bills of material that can give you choices that are dependent. We have a lot of uh, manufacturers. Um, for instance, as an example, if you're, say, a furniture manufacturer or a toy manufacturer, you may have, say, a push toy that could, that, of a horse. So that horse could be done in 15 different colors. Well, instead of having 15 bills of material, you have one, you have one bill of material and you have a uh, list of colors that could be applied to that toy. Uh, makes it very simple. You bring out a new color, you add one part number to the bill, you're set to produce that color. So that's kind of the purpose and background of a uh, modular bill and its importance. Our bills follow revisions. Uh, revisions can have active inactive dates. The individual children that are on here can each have active inactive dates. As a matter of fact, it may be important because if materials change, you may want to set a date that says, okay, I currently use this style wood that's not that's going to be unavailable after this date, so I'm going to substitute this other style wood. So I can put an inactive date for the material that's no longer available, uh, so it gives me time to use up my stock, and an active date for when to start using the next uh, child that's going to replace that item that became uh, inactive. So we do full, full revision support right down to active and inactive, both on parent and child. Uh, BOMs can have images. Uh, it's very simple to go out and pick up an image. I'll go to my, say, my sample company here. And I'll pick a picture here. And I'll say, OK, I'll add this image to that bill of material. That's how you add it into your bill of material. Uh, that simple. Uh, so we provide images and, uh, and the, with the bill of material. Another use for this is this can be used since a Lear will support publishing information to the cloud. Images that you put in here could be used to support your online website uh, for bicycles or product views or whatever you have. I think we have uh, uh, one item in here. Do I have one for? Trader? Nope, I don't. Okay. Uh, but basically, any anything you have could be built and cataloged inside of here, inside of this bill. Okay. To go with the bills, you have the uh, master routes. Uh, you saw what a master route basically looked like on that work order that we looked at, looked at. Here's what the, here's where that master route came from. Um, that master route is backed up with an operational library. So if you have predefined steps that you go through, machining centers, uh, deburring, inspections, uh, those are all things that can be placed into a library. So that as you build routes, instead of having to enter it from scratch, you can pull your steps out of a library to help you assist, to assist you building that particular master route. And you'll see the, the components here, the master route, the bill of material, those are all components that you saw back in the work order. When I start that work order, it's going to take this route and append that route to the work order. And it's going to take this bill of material and append that bill of material to that work order. And it's going to, going to take how that bill of material is configured and append that to the work order. So all these pieces roll upwards into that work order. The reason they're appended is very straightforward because they can be edited right on the work order. If you have to add steps on a work order, if you have to add additional material on a work order, you can do that right on the work order. So it keeps that work order moving smoothly. Uh, a lot of people say, well, how do I how do I start in this system? It's big, it can be it can be intimidating, it can be complex. Well, we you start with a route that says make it one step. And then as you put that route out in the shop, 
you record how you build something by appending those transactions to the to the work order as they go along. Um, and in the end, you say, yep, that's the way I want to build it from now on. Well, you can take that route on that work order and turn it into a master route for, for further use. And the same with bills of material. So that's how, that's how those pieces work together. Logistics side, let me run a schedule for you very quickly. We're a finite forward backward scheduler. It runs a scheduler that will run thousands of operations per second. Uh, I mean, literally in less than a second here, elapsed time, less than zero. It ran 23 operations across six machines. It produced a report for me. That report can take the form of, of, a, of a traditional PERT chart. I can zoom in on that to see the load of my work centers. I can see how a particular work order is going to be processed through the shop. I can look at individual steps. If uh, I have a question on something, I can double click on it and drill down right to the work order that that, that particular item is doing on my PERT chart here. Um, lots and lots of backup detail uh, that you can look at in this thing. I can look at, uh, let's see here, schedule inquiry where I can see a load in my factory and it'll show me my load per day. I can see by, by, by a particular area in my shop what my load is. I can drill down to see on particular days what my load is. So there's a lot of backup when it schedules that for you, okay? Um, in addition to that, there is, this will, I'm sure most manufacturers are familiar with the term MRP, Materials Requirement Planning. Well, we take it right out to the end. We have a process that we call um, synchronized, uh, it, it, it's called synchronous manufacturing. And what that does, it says schedule synchronization. We'll say, yes, please schedule it. This will plan out every order that I need and every every work order, every purchase order that I need, it will open up a screen for me. It'll show me all of my recommended work orders, all of my recommended purchase orders that need to be placed to meet your production demand. Not only will it show you, but you can actually click on them and it will actually generate it like this here. It will actually generate that purchase order. It'll put that purchase order out to whatever manufacturer, in this case here, it's uh, recommending this purchase order, go to this manufacturer, AB01. Uh, it's gonna tell me when it's needed, when I have to order it, wh what location I'm gonna receive it in, who's the buyer, what product class it belongs to, if it's for a particular sales order, it tells me what sales order. When I click that button, it'll generate that purchase order for me right down here, purchase order. And I can even generate it as accepted. The way our system is set up, that simply by doing that, generating that purchase order, it will automatically create an email, attach that purchase order to it, and send it to the vendor. So right at the planning, right at the planning stage right here, I'm not only generating that order, I'm placing it with the supplier automatically. Okay, extremely powerful system. The same way with the uh, work orders. Uh, this will automatically generate work order orders for me down through every single level, not just the top level, but if I've got an eight, eight level indebted bill, it'll generate every level down through that bill, schedule it and dovetail it all together and produce every work order that I need. When I talked about synchronous, what I was talking about is everybody's familiar with this term JIT? Well, we take it a step way beyond that. Back here in engineering, we have a item route, uh, I'm sorry, an assigned material. And what it's doing is it's saying, when I make this item and I use this route, here's a list of the items and their quantities. And what I want to do is I want to take those, and let me pick one, here we go, here we go. It has many different steps on it. Take this list of items and tell me what step that they're going to be used on and in what quantity. So when I run a schedule and I come up with a schedule that tells me what step one job is going to be done, how it's going to be processed through my shop, I can actually tell you that 
you need this list of material for this job on this step on this work center at 9 a.m. Wednesday morning. That's called synchronizing your material with your actual production schedule. Very advanced form of planning. Okay. Well, that's kind of a real quick overview. There's obviously a huge number of other things that we do. That gives you some idea of the capabilities of the system. And I will turn off the motor mouth at this point and open it up if anybody would like to ask me any questions. Linda, you want to take it from here? Well, if anybody has any questions they would like to ask, um, feel free to do that either through the chat window or um, take yourself off mute. Uh, Rod, what a fantastic uh, demonstration that was, and thank you so very much. Very first time I did it, Linda. Seriously, I now. <laughs> <laughs> And I do want to point this down to McVeigh speaking. I do want to point out that many companies, although you have this flexibility, right, uh, hinted to it, many companies start out with just bill material and work order because the layer will handle that too. It'll do all those steps, do a, set up a single route for you, for you, set up a single operation, one step, uh, and then all you're doing is you're starting making a work order, make goods, and then completing it. And uh, you build that that's a good point, Dennis. I, I tend to overlook that as I try to present everything we do, and sometimes it can overwhelm people, but you can actually pick whatever level you want to start at or whatever level is important to you and uh, just get those modules. Yeah. So you the simple as manager, build material, and work order, and you're off and running. Well, we've got just a couple of moments before two, so I don't want to take up anybody else's, you know, take up very much of anybody's time. So if no one has any questions, um, Tandem Technologies thanks you for attending this demo today. If you are working with one of our consultants um, and have questions, you may feel more comfortable reaching out to them. However, if you're not working one of, with one of the consultants and you have been speaking with me, please feel free to uh, give me a call. And um, we look forward to being able to work with you and uh, showing you some more of Valir. And again, thank you, Rod. Thank Thanks, you. Rod. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Pre appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm.